Now, don't listen to me. Romans chapter 8. It's the next book over. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8. I... Oh, uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. In my version, they're right next to each other. I don't know what you're, what you're reading. But... Yeah, we'll try Romans chapter 8, if I can find it. If it is in this version. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8 says this in verse 31, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, <clears throat> who can be against us? Let's bow our heads and let's talk to the Lord. Father, I am glad I'm saved tonight. I'm glad, Father, for every person here who is saved. God, uh, please, please uh, help us not to take our salvation lightly. Help us to realize just how good it is to be saved, God. Uh, help us to realize that we got more than just uh, a free ticket to heaven, Father. We, we got so much when we got saved. God, help us not to look at the <clears throat> problems of the world around us uh, and, uh, and have them actually seem bigger sometimes, God, than what is important. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, for eternal life. And God, I pray that you'll uh, bless the message tonight. I pray, God, that you will speak to each person. God, that your will will be done in each life. God, help us to remember that we are here to live for you, not you there to live for us. God, uh, uh, edify your church tonight that you might be glorified. <clears throat> in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, it says there at the end of that verse, If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, to be honest, the answer comes back threefold. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Okay? And uh, if you're having a problem, I can guarantee it can be, uh, it can be cataloged uh, under the world, the flesh, or the devil. That's just about, uh, about how it is. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk to you tonight <clears throat> about the problems that you have with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And uh, just so basically so you know what's what. Uh, a lot of folks don't, uh, they're, they're having problems, they don't even know what or why. Uh, everything is the devil's fault. Now look, I am not, uh, by any stretch of imagination, an advocate for the devil. Uh, in fact, nothing sends me ballistic faster than to be talking to some stupid Christian and have them say this, Well, let me be the devil's advocate for a minute. Why do you think you need to give his argument? Uh, you, know, you know, nothing would bless me more than if the devil had a side to an argument and I was the only one that could deliver it. Nothing would bless me more than not speaking and just knowing he was getting shortchanged. Just knowing he wasn't getting fairly treated. I can't just imagine, you know, anything, any, anything better uh, than the devil uh, uh, not getting uh, fair treatment. But the reason I'm saying this is because a lot of what we blame the devil for, people, a lot of what's, uh, you know, what you've uh, had problems in your life, uh, and you say, oh, the devil made me do it, the devil made me do it. Uh, you know something, when, when it happened to you, the devil was out of town that weekend. Some of the things, some of the problems you've had, the devil was surprised when he heard about it. Well, that's the truth. So I'm going to talk to you about the world. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the life of David, <clears throat> King David, who is an amazing man in Scripture. And we're going to look at the life of David, and uh, we're going to look at uh, and how, how the world attacked him, how he survived ta attacks of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And then uh, you take it and superimpose it over your life and see, uh, uh, see what you might need some help with. I want you to go now to 2 Samuel. And that is where I want you to go. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5. That's right after 1 Samuel. If you have trouble with that. 2 Samuel chapter 5. Now, you should be familiar enough with your Bible to know that in um, 1 Samuel chapter 31, the last chapter of that book, King Saul dies in battle with the Philistines. Uh, uh, a portion of Israel uh, anoints David to be king there in 2 Samuel chapter 2, but <clears throat> not all of Israel. And that does not happen until 2 Samuel chapter 5. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, all of Israel accepts David as their king. And no sooner does he get that kingdom than trouble comes. Look what it says, verse 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. And David heard of it and went down to the hold. Now people, this, <clears throat> this is a Bible example of an attack by the world. Uh, in fact, we use the Philistines as an illustration or a type of the world when we preach. It is a type of the world. That's what the Philistine is. And notice, it doesn't say they're coming against Israel this time. It said they're after David. Now, I'll tell you how you know when you are, you are uh, experiencing an attack by the world. They want you. 
I mean somebody's out to get you. Not your church, not your family, not uh, Christianity in general. I mean, <clears throat> they don't like you. They want you destroyed. Uh, there have been many times when Israel and the Philistines, when those armies had faced uh, uh, each other across a, uh, a field of battle, and I'm telling you that in this instance... If they had faced each other and one Philistine soldier could have just happily uh, fired off an arrow and it would have plunged into the heart of the David, as soon as the Philistines heard about it, they'd have turned around and went home. All they wanted to do was kill David. So you know it's the world when the attack is personal, when they're after, <clears throat> when they're after you. And by the way, think about this. Who is attacking David? Who did it just say? Philistine. Yeah. You know who those people were? That's the crowd he was just running with. He just came out of the world. Hadn't he just been living with the Philistines before the death of Saul and before his coming to the throne of Israel? So, man, I'll tell you, you know, you want to find uh, uh, who's going to give you a hard time sometimes when you first get saved or decide you're going to live for the Lord? The old crowd. Yeah, right. That's right. The world. Yep. It's okay. <clears throat> what do I do with the world? Well, first I want you to notice that the Bible says, verse 17, he went down to the hold. Don't misread that. It didn't say he went down to the bunker. All right, again, I've never seen Christians uh, in, in my life in any generation more willing to uh, dig a hole, jump inside, pull the dirt on top of themselves, and wait for the end. <clears throat> he's not going down to the hold so that he doesn't have to fight. He's going down to the hold so he doesn't react in the flesh. You ever do that? You know when somebody picks on you, isn't it kind of easy to just let God out of the loop and take care of this yourself? So David, because look what he does. He goes down to the hold, and he doesn't say, God, make the Philistines go away, or God, do something bad to them. Look what happens in, in the next verse. And the Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David <clears throat> inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? He went down into the hold to pray, to seek God's face, seek, God, seek God's direction, and said, If I've got to, I will go out and fight them. Most of you, anytime there's any kind of trouble, you want to go down into the hold, and you want your preacher, you want somebody else, or you want God Himself to strike somebody with a bolt of lightning. You don't want to get into the fray. None of us want to fight. You say, well, I'm afraid if I, if I, um, if I go against them, they won't like me. Dummy, they're after you because they don't like you. <laughs> that is already an established fact. Do you realize there wasn't anything David was going to be able to do in battle that would offend the Philistines? What were they going to do? Start a war? <laughs> They'd already done that. <clears throat> now, what I'm going to tell you is this. If, uh, if you sense that it is the world that is after you, the first thing you do is don't react. Do not react to them, but get alone, get down on your face to God in the hold, and say, God, what should I do? That's not a big deal. You don't have a problem with that. Here's the, here's the one you have a problem with. Be prepared to fight. Say, how do you mean fight? Fight? Well, yes, but do you mean fight? I mean, you may have to get in somebody's face. Now, please, don't, you know, I may be talking to a postal worker here, and I could be having a, <clears throat> you know, I could just see, I can read tomorrow's papers, you know. The preacher told, <clears throat> told me to take care of this. <clears throat> I don't mean go out there, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and take somebody's head off or they like that. But, you know, you may end up having to stand nose to nose and toe to toe with an adversary if it's the world. That's what happened in this case. The Philistines started a fight, and God told David, go out and fight. You say, yeah, but if you go out to battle, you could die. Not if God's with you. Not if God told him to go out. Verse 19, and David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go out, <coughs> shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. Now, here's the problem. Like I said, we don't like, we, have, we get kind of a crazy thing, you know. I don't know what your youth was like, but uh, we got a whole generation and nobody wants to be rejected. Nobody wants anybody to dislike them. Don't you realize someone is always going to dislike you? Now, if you are honest, haven't you ever just seen somebody for your first time and said, I don't like them? Yeah, I just don't like that guy. <laughs> then they spoke and you knew you were right. <laughs> Or maybe there was a personal confrontation and they, you just don't like them. Now, I, that, I don't have a problem with you not liking everybody. I have a problem if you seek to hurt them. I, we're not allowed to hurt them. But just like you don't like, so there, that's how people are about us. And it may be your personality. It may not be Christianity. 
All right? We like to blame every problem we have on persecution and God, and, and it's all because it's because I'm a Christian. No, maybe you got a smart mouth. Maybe you're a little lazy. All right, at the job. I'm telling you the truth, you know. <clears throat> maybe uh, your neighbor didn't like you painting your house orange. <laughs> What I'm saying is that it's not always, it's not always the gospel. And so here they come, they come against David, and David had to go out and be willing to contend. And so David goes out and fights him. And here's the problem. You say, well, I don't want to fight with anybody. Then you will deny God the victory. You better understand something, folks. You know, they'll think about no man is an island. I mean, nothing you're doing is unto yourself, even if it's by accident. God has got a stake in everything in your life. Oh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> I kind of had a deja vu there. <laughs> Look what it says, verse 20, And David came to baal Perizim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as a breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place baal Perizim, and there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. Do you see who got the ultimate victory? Hey, do you know how much God, how excited God gets when somebody gets rid of idols? I mean, God hates false gods. God hates competition. God has a monopoly on the God business. He doesn't care about the Security Exchange Commission whatsoever. He, Bill Gates can have computers. God has a throne. Amen. And when somebody starts burning idols, it blesses his heart. Amen. So the ultimate victory, though, they, though somebody else picked the fight... David went out and fought the fight, and God got the victory. <clears throat> I, um, I learned a great truth before I got saved. Uh, it was a spiritual truth. I didn't know at the time that I was uh, learning that spiritual truth. Uh, I didn't know there was a spiritual truth. I was, in fact, I was about half drunk on wine when I learned it. But um, uh, I was lost. Now, let me explain. Uh, before I got saved, I was a street fighter. And, and you know, there are no fights in movies that represent a street fight, because there's nothing glamorous about a street fight. You know, you go into this western scene, and this guy goes, and don't even knock off the guy's hat. And the guy goes, oh, that was a good one. I think you broke my nose. Uh, you mind if I break this bottle over your head? Oh, sweet me, you know. Oh, that was a good one. I'll probably need stitches, but before I do, may I hit you with this chair? Of course. That is not a street fight. <clears throat> You know, 30 seconds before a fight starts, both people, both belligerents, are telling each other what they're going to do to each other. 30 seconds after it starts, they're out there rolling around in the mud and the blood, and usually one of them is on the top, the, the other one is on the bottom, and the one on the bottom usually is uh, overtaken with visions of world peace. I mean, why can't we be friends? Gee, we don't have to be doing this. Uh, I, I promise, if you want me to, I'll quit hitting you in the fist with my face. You know, that kind of stuff. And, well, that's what it was. And, and I'll tell you what, after a while, you get tired. I went home one time, uh, and all I had left of my shirt was, was the collar and the part that the buttons go through. Now, I thought my mother would be excited. Think of how much easier the laundry would be. Much less ironing. But mothers don't see this like we do, and so... I had a good friend of mine. His name was Billy Murray. Billy Murray was a little Irishman. And Billy was a Golden Gloves boxer. <clears throat> and so uh, I can remember one, one it was, a, it was a, just a winter's night there in Maslin. We're walking down the street. Each one had a bottle of Ripple wine in our hand. And I said, Billy, teach me stand-up fighting. He said, what? I said, teach me to fight standing up. I said, maybe I can get through the next without holes in the pants. Now, now I realize that's a fashion, you know. I'm, all those jeans, I made those. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> honestly, I said, maybe I can get home next time without my shirt being torn off or my holes in the knees of my, my pants. And so teach me to fight standing up. Well, now, I knew nothing about boxing. In fact, I knew so little that, that when we started to spar, put our bottles down in the snow, I, I started leading right. He said, don't lead right. I said, well, he said, you're right-handed, right? I said, yeah. He said that, well, you always lead with your weak hand. And he said, you jab, and you jab with your left, and what you try to do is get an opening so that you can bring your right in. He said, if you lead with your right, you get the opening, you got nothing to bring across. Okay? So I'm, 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 we're, we're in the street light, and, and we're sparring, you know, and, and, and we're throwing a few punches, and I'm jabbing, and I'm doing real fine, and then all of a sudden, I, 
I said, wow, look at all those stars. I didn't notice those stars before. You know, blue ones and orange, green. Honest, man, I mean, it was a real pyrotechnical show. I said, I, well, I just kind of enjoyed the show for a few minutes, and uh, <clears throat> directly I shook it off, and, and here's Billy standing in front of me, and he's just grinning. I said, what are you smiling about? Because I realized that I really don't think I had been exactly where he was for a few seconds, and he said, you've seen stars. I said, yeah, I did. How'd you know? He said, I got you. I said, what do you mean you got me? He says, I got you. I got you. And he said, you've seen stars. I said, well, Billy, <clears throat> I said, when, you, when you're fighting and somebody hits you so you see stars, what is the standard operating procedure? What do you do to keep this guy, you know, from hammering you? He said, well, he said, the standard operating procedure when somebody hits you so you see stars, is he said, you take that right and you throw it out there as hard and as fast as you can. I said, Billy, I don't even know where I am. I don't know where you are. Why am I throwing a punch at you? He said, well, here, there's two reasons. And he said, the first reason is, he said, your natural reaction is to drop your hands and watch the stars, which I am a very natural person. <laughs> Down went my hands, and I just stood there, and, and he said, and he said, this guy is going to kill you. She so said, by throwing that right out, the guy, it, it at least is in his way. He's got to work around it, for, and it might buy you a, a second and save your life. But then came the second reason. Here was the spiritual application. He said, uh, he said, the second reason is this. In order for me to hit you so you see stars, I have got to be open to the same punch. And he said, when you throw that right out, there's just a chance. You might tag him. Now, do you understand tonight that that rule right there is the oldest rule of warfare? The oldest rule of warfare is that before you can kill anybody, you've got to be in a position where you can be. Yeah, you can sit there. You know, you're behind this building. Well, I've got this super heat-seeking bullet in my rifle. All i got to do is step around and... <laughs> oh, well, you know, this whole thing, I mean, from bombs to planes to artillery to artillery that shoots farther uh, to, to satellites to, to uh, anti-ballistic or ballistic missiles, uh, it is all based on how can I kill without getting killed, which is, that's where the fun really ends in war. <clears throat> so I said, okay, Billy, I said, uh, let's go back at it. So, so if we start sparring again, I'm really kind of watching Billy. Because I know that he's got two hands here and another one somewhere. <laughs> and, and it's a quick one. And so, so we're sparring, you know, ducking, and I'm, I'm kind of staying out, you know, and get, look at those stars. Oh, there are more than there were. What did Billy tell me to do? Oh, blue. Look at the blue. Anyway, uh, he told me to throw my right out as hard and fast as I could. So I did it. Here's exactly what I did. I'm looking at the stars, and I threw my right out. Oh. I felt like I was punching through peanut butter. It took about an hour and a half. Honest. When he said throw it out his heart, it was like slow motion. I'm going like this. I thought Billy could go home, take a shower, eat a sandwich, come back, and still duck this punch. So, so I, I, you know, I throw this out. He never told me anything else I had to do, so now I enjoyed the stars. And <clears throat> directly they began to fade. Where's Billy? I didn't even know about a rapture. It happened. <laughs> I said, where is Billy? I mean, I couldn't see him. And I looked up two houses away. Billy is going through a snow-covered yard like this. <laughs> I said, whoa, Billy. I said, I said, I was looking at him. You were chasing him. <laughs> I said, what happened? He said, you got it. You got it. <laughs> Lesson ended. I said, what happened? He said, man, when you threw that right out there, brother, I was gone. <clears throat> the oldest rule of warfare is that when somebody comes after you, they are open to the same thing. David, when he became king of Israel, had no intention of saying, I am now king. I think I'll go start a war of the Philistines. He was going to mind his own business. Have you ever had anybody start anything with you when you were minding your own business? 
and they, he was minding his own business, and the Philistines sought to kill him, which meant they were in a position to be what? Yes. So when somebody is out to get your job, what does that mean? That means they're in a position to lose their job. Now, you better keep that in mind if you decide to be the world and go after somebody. Because you may open yourself to a punch and find yourself walking through the snow-covered yard wondering what happened. And now you say, okay, so David whipped him, and, uh, and they learned a lesson and they never came back. That's, that's wonderful. That's just not real. If there's anything about the world, you should know by now, they never give up when they get whipped. How many times you've seen in your life, you know, they want to pass some kind of a bond program for something? It gets voted down, and they say, the people just need to be educated. We're going to put it on the ballot again next year. But didn't you hear no? What part of no do you not understand? So here the Philistines had come. Remember one time uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, enemy, the, it was uh, Nebuchadnezzar, came against Israel. He got whipped. And what did they say? Well, you know, the, the Jewish God is the God of the mountains, and so we fought him on the mountains, and that was our problem, but we'll whip him in the plains. So God had to whip him twice. So unfortunately, uh, you're going to find out that you're going to have to face this thing twice. Watch what happens, verse 20, uh, 22. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephium. Now, this is where they fought before. And what happened? David whipped them. He knows what to do. Go out there and pound them. Wrong. Just because you had a victory doesn't mean you're guaranteed the second one. But David did do what he did, did before. He went down and talked to God. First thing you better always do when somebody's after you is you had better get a hold of God because you're going into battle. Do you understand that? Verse 23, And David inquired of the Lord and said, uh, he's, uh, I'm sorry, And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when, uh, when thou hearest the sound of the going in the tops of the, uh, of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gazer. So what you're going to find is that if there's somebody at work, somebody in the world, they are after you, you may have to, number one, go down to the hold and seek God's direction. Number two, ugly or not, you may have to face them and get ugly with them and whip them. Now, remember this, <clears throat> whatever they're trying to do to you, I do not mean you should seek to do it to them. I mean it may happen. That's what they're exposing themselves to. But you'll probably have to do it twice. I had this happen in my life one time. I remember uh, <clears throat> I was a youth director on a church of about 1,800 people. And so I had a uh, youth department, a very large youth department, and our church... Uh, had a, uh, a uh, Christian school. It had its own building, you know, right across the parking lot. And, and now, I, I'm a believer in Christian education, but boy, I worry about the, the masculinity factor in some Christian schools. There's a lot of males. I haven't seen a lot of men, all right? And our school had a lot of, uh, uh, you know, males, but no men. And, and guys, you know, we appreciate men. And so <clears throat> they had a guy over there my young people would come over and they'd say, Hey, you know what this guy's telling us? I said, What? If somebody hits you, let them hit you. <laughs> if you think that's Christian, tell me. Because I want to hit you. <laughs> I've been looking for you for years. Okay. Just some idiot that would let me keep hitting them. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, more. I love it. Yeah. This <clears throat> and, uh, and you can understand that I taught something somewhat differently. And so, you know, they go to their class, and this wimpo, you know, he'd be telling them, you know, don't, don't. They said this. They said, well, if somebody is beating your head against a concrete block wall, sh what should you do? And he said, don't resist. <laughs> Which is probably where this man's problem came from. <laughs> All right? That's probably what the, somebody beat his head against a wall. And <clears throat> so, so he decided that it was time to confront me and set me straight. So he came over, I mean, he had his best skirt and blouse on the day he showed up. <laughs> and he sat down, and he, and he sat down, now, he sat in my office across the desk from me, and he said, uh, uh, we have a problem here, you're telling the young men they should defend themselves. Now, you imagine how I took this, 
And so uh, we talked a little bit. I asked him, I said this, I said, uh, what would you do if somebody broke in your house and attacked your wife? He said, I'd pray for him. I said, I wouldn't. I don't pray for the dead. <laughs> now, maybe in his case, but I'd pray for him and the, the guy and his wife. It's probably the first man she ever met. So, <clears throat> it didn't go real well for him. I, I really shouldn't have made him cry. But anyway, <laughs> he left. He left. Now, do you understand? This was not of my making. I did not start this. He decided he was going to come and talk to me. And so I'd already prayed. Well, that was that. Well, <clears throat> about that time, he went over and he whined and whimpered to the Christian school principal, who was a very good friend of the pastor. And somewhere in this Christian school principal's mind, he decided it was time for God to call Brother Gipp somewhere else. So he began a campaign to defraud me to the pastor, unbeknownst to me. I am ignorant of this. And he began in his, um, uh, you know, almost daily conversations with the pastor to, <clears throat> to uh, uh, say something that was derogatory, point out some problem with me until my pastor had had all he could take of me, and I wasn't doing it. And finally, I remember when the pastor said this, it was on a Monday, and he said, tomorrow morning, I want you in my office at 9 o'clock. Brother so-and-so, this, this uh, Christian school principal, is going to be in my office. He's got some charges to bring. And, and I tell you, you know what this meant? Here's what was going to go on. I was going in at 9. Whenever this guy got done, I was coming back, cleaning my, out my office, and leaving. I was going to be fired. That's all there was to it. So I went in at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, like I usually did, and <clears throat> I prayed. Whoa, did I pray. I mean, I was down on my face from 8 to 8.30, and you know what God told me? I said, God, I said, I'm going to go in there at 9 o'clock. This guy is going to try to get me fired. What should I do? What should I do? You know what God told me? Nothing. He never said a word. Do you know how you feel when you're going into that kind of a situation, and God gives you no direction whatsoever? You don't feel real competent. So at 8.30, and I wasn't being ugly to God. I just said this, hey, God. I am asking you what you're going to do or what I should do. You're not talking to me. And I'll tell you, you're looking at a guy that hates to waste time, even if it's wasted talking to God. And I said, I'm not going to waste my time talking anymore. I said, I'm not done with my personal Bible reading, so I'm just going to read my Bible for the next half hour and then go in and lose my life. <clears throat> so, so I just read my Bible, and I happen to be reading in Psalms. Go there. The book of Psalms, Psalm 31. Now, I know, that, <clears throat> I know that we have a natural tendency to go to Psalms when we have some kind of a problem. That's not what I was doing here. I was just reading through the book of Psalms in my personal reading, and I thought for the next half hour, why be on my knees and talk to the walls when I can read my Bible and then go get my head taken off? So I was reading along here, and I got down to here, and it said this, um, verse 10, for my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. I was a reproach among all mine enemies. I said, well, that's me. I am a reproach to this guy across the parking lot who I've done nothing to. In fact, look what it says. But especially among my neighbors. I said, this Christian school principal is my neighbor. He's right there. And I am a reproach to him. I said, well, this is for me. And a fear to mine acquaintance, they that did see me without fled from me. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mine. I am like a broken vessel. I said, that's me. <clears throat> I kept reading verse 13. For I have heard the slander of many. I said, God, that is exactly what I'm going through right now. You know what I realized at this very moment as I read this? That at the time David wrote this, he was a youth director. <laughs> in a very large church that had a Christian school and the principal didn't like him. I mean, there's no other way <clears throat> I can explain how he knew exactly what I was going through. I've heard the slander of me. Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. That's exactly what was going on. 
This guy was slandering me. He was. Fear was on every side. I had nowhere to turn. And he was devising to take away my life. He didn't care if I lost my job, my wife, my kids starved. It didn't mean anything to him. And I, I got down to verse 13. I said, God, I said, this is me. What should I do? This time God answered. You know what he said? That's exactly what he said. He said, keep reading. And I read verse 14. He said, but I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my God. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I said, God. I said, in half an hour, I said, I'm going to be stepping into a room where this guy wants, to, wants me fired. Now, you're telling me you want me to go in that room? I walked into the pastor's office. I knew there was, you know, a kind of a bad air when the pastor met me and said, Hello, Brother Giff. It's been so nice to know you. <laughs> and he came over and he sat me down on his couch. Now, my preacher had the world's lowest couch. I personally think he must have cut about two inches off the, the, the legs of this thing. Because when you sat there, you're, you know, it's about this half, and you sit down and you're looking up. <laughs> now, my preacher's desk was a decommissioned aircraft carrier. He is seated behind this thing. Navy jets <clears throat> are landing. I'm sitting down here. And here is my main accuser. And he, ha he is ready, buddy. He's got his little, his little folder and his packet of stuff. And, he and so, you know, the pastor said, Brother Gippo, so-and-so here has some charges to bring against you. You know, these very serious readers. And blah, 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 blah. And uh, yeah. so I said, okay. So I sat down. And he said, go ahead. So this guy started talking. And talking. And talking. When this guy started talking, it was a filibuster. He didn't stop for 45 minutes. And <clears throat> here was the problem. In that 45 minutes, this man built a coffin, climbed inside, and nailed it shut on himself. <laughs> he, it was so funny because he goes like this. He said, well, the first thing I want you to know, the Brother Gip thinks that these young men, Christian men, should defend themselves. And I watched my pastor. My pastor is ready for something that he's going to put me in a box. And he goes like this. I mean, here's what he goes. Like, so what's wrong with that? <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, I want, I, say, I want to say, don't tell him that. He'll like me. <laughs> really, I thought, I mean, man, if you want to get me fired, don't tell him something he's got. And then he said something else, and I watched my pastor go, <laughs> really? <laughs> and he liked that. And I'm going, oh, don't say any more. <laughs> I want to say this. I'm going to say, wait, wait, here. Tell him this. This will get me fired. <laughs> so for 45 minutes, this guy, <clears throat> this guy rattled off his case. At the end of 45 minutes, the pastor said this. He stood up. He said, Brother Gip, I am sorry for having called you in here. You can go. You know, all I said in that whole conversation was hello when I got there and goodbye when I left. And two weeks later, we had a new Christian school principal. Now, do you understand? I did not try to get him fired. It was never a goal in my life, even when I went in there. In fact, in that case, my goal wasn't even to defend myself. My goal was, don't ask me. I'm just supposed to trust God and shut up, which is kind of tough for me. <laughs> but do you see what? You know what happened to that man? The punch he threw, he got hit with. That's what happened with the Philistines. That's what happens with the world. <clears throat> so the world, you know it's the world when they come after you. You know to go to the hold and seek God's face. Be prepared to have to defend yourself. That's right. Argue your case. <clears throat> hey, if somebody is trying to get you fired, that does not mean try to get them fired, but that is the position they are putting themselves in. Then expect them to come back again, get back down in the hold, and this time it may go different. I want you to go, if you will, to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. <clears throat> this is, um, I, I preach out of an old Schofield Bible, and right under the words chapter 11 it says in italics, David's great sin. Uh, you can, that's not inspired and that's not right. This is not David's great sin. <coughs> in fact, in just a few minutes we will, I will show you David's great sin. You say, David, there was something worse than adultery. Oh, yes. Yeah, there was something worse than adultery. Our problem is this. If I ask you what are the two worst sins a man can commit, and I, I'm not promoting murder and adultery, okay? But that's what you'd say. Murder, adultery, murder, adultery, murder, adultery. Why? Because those are sins against us. 
Those are horizontal sins. You take a man's wife, you ruin his life. You kill him, you ruin the whole day. So, <clears throat> so we always think that those are the worst thing that can happen. There's actually a sin that is worse, and we will look at it. But this is a pretty bad sin, all right, unless you're the president. But, um, <clears throat> no, I, no, I take that back, unless you're a liberal president. Because if you were conservative, they'd hang you. All right, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, look what it says in verse 1. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba. <clears throat> but David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came, it came to pass in evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very, very beautiful to look upon. And David said, and inquired after the woman, and one said, <clears throat> Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that portion of Scripture read, <clears throat> followed by this statement, For the devil got David. Folks, the devil's not even mentioned in the chapter. He didn't even make an appearance. You know, the devil was probably plotting David's fall, and when he, this came in, he went, Yes, great! It's better than I could have done! This isn't the devil. This is the flesh. What I'm saying is this. If there was no devil, if the devil dropped dead today, there is enough flesh in this room, in every individual, to end your Christian life without the devil lifting a finger. And a lot of what we say, the devil made me do it, like I already told you, he, did, he wasn't even in town when it happened. <clears throat> you say, well, okay, what do I do when it's the flesh? How do I know? Well, I want you to notice what happens. Now, when the world attacks, the world is after you. You know that, generally speaking, I know I'm supposed to say, well, you're going out there. I had a guy, I heard this one time, this fellow was a, a Christian man. <clears throat> had one of those jobs where he'd go out of town. He was very true to his wife and good in church and, and regular, you know, and those other things. And one time, this guy decided to be untrue to his wife and got AIDS. But that's not what always happens. In fact, you'll be surprised when you see who pays for the sins of the flesh. Look at chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan, verse 1, unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, <clears throat> There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. Do you know what we often overlook when we read uh, 2 Samuel 12, 3? You know what that is? That is a description of how much Uriah loved Bathsheba. Do you know that Uriah was one of David's mighty men? You meet Uriah on a field of battle, and that may be the last person on this earth you meet. Uriah was a mighty man. He'd take your head off. Then he would come home and hang up that armor and treat her like a queen. He was good to this lady. He loved this lady. I will contend this, that <clears throat> after he was gone and she married David, yeah, I'll bet the house was nicer. I'll bet the clothes were finer and the food was, the, the fare was all much better. But I, she was just part of a harem now. She was number seven. Three more were on the way. Hey, listen, nobody loved her like Uriah loved her. So what happens? Verse 4. Now watch what they, watch David's decreed judgment on his own sin. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, <clears throat> and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man hath done this thing shall surely die. All right, who had done it? Well, David just condemned himself to death. But he's not done condemning. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. David's decree, David's judgment on this sin is this man has to die and he's going to lose four lambs. Watch what happens. Verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thou hast, uh, thus saith the Lord of uh, Israel, 
I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. It goes on down here. Now watch what happens. Here's the judgment as it stands. David's got to die. David's got to lose four lambs. Look at verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Now look up here. According to David's judgment, David's got to die. He's got to lose four lambs. What just happened? That's right. This portion of the judgment was just rescinded divinely. He does not have to. Was this rescinded? No. So David's still going to lose four lambs. Okay, pick four. <laughs> All right. So they have a child. And the baby dies. Well, you say, you think David was torn up about it. I, I think it was really mixed emotions. I think David realized this was a child of sin. It would have been very embarrassing to him when, when everybody asked how old the boy was. Fifteen. And how long have your folks been married? Fourteen. <laughs> so... He lost a kid. Oh, well, gee, that was too bad. I hated to see it happen. Let's go on with our lives. Then Amnon, his son, messes up with Tamar, his daughter, and gets killed. And I think, and that's why, remember, that's why he never chased Absalom. See, I think when number two happened, I think David now began to see a trend. And he thought, uh-oh, is this this fourfold judgment that I have decreed on my own sin? So he said, leave Absalom alone. Leave him alone. So <clears throat> Absalom ends up t trying to take over the kingdom. Absalom goes out to, to battle. Do you remember David's admonishment to Joab? Deal kindly with the young man. Why? Because he knows if he loses another one, he's going to lose another one. So they go out to battle, and as it should have, Absalom dies. Do you remember David's grief? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. Don't you remember what he said? His exact words were, I would to God, I had died. This is what he's talking about. So I wish I'd have died, boys. Now you know what he knows? He's got another one coming. And this old man's going to do everything he can to bust the trend. And you go over to 1 Kings, and you don't have to turn there, but 1 Kings chapter 1, he's an old man. And Adonijah decides, I'm going to be king. He gets him 50 men to run before his chariot. He's got all this, uh, these horsemen and everything going out before him. And word comes to David, Adonijah has declared himself king. And you know what David said? Adonijah is going to kill Solomon. Or Solomon's going to kill Adonijah. There's going to be a war. Either way, I'm losing the fourth kid. So what he quickly does is he takes Solomon, puts him on his throne, declares him king, and Adonijah sees the lay of the land and comes, bows to the king Solomon, and doesn't die. You know who dies? David. I mean, 70 years, off he goes. And on his deathbed, he thinks about losing these three kids and says, I guess it was just life. Man, I thought for, I thought for sure that I was going to lose four. I thought that it was that fourfold curse, but it wasn't. It was just something that happened in life. And he died. And one day in heaven, he's walking around, and he says, Hey, Moses, man, yeah, it's great to be up here. Hey, yeah, you're right. Well, Abraham, I'll tell him, yeah, you're good, good. Hey, Adonijah, man, it's good to see you, son. And, hey, Adonijah, what are you doing up here? Oh, Dad, after you died, I tried to take the kingdom again, and Solomon killed me. You knew pays for the sins of the flesh of the parents, the children. You know, if you've got a secret sin in your life right now, I, I said, I'm supposed to tell you that someday the lights are going to go on and you're going to get caught and you're going to have some kind of grief in your life. That may happen. That may happen. But now I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Your kid's are going to pay the price. In all seriousness, I have great compassion and pity for Chelsea Clinton. Because she's going to reap what two of the filthiest people in this country have wrought. All right? I mean, the stuff that is going on with her father and her mother, where they have allowed their flesh to run wild, that girl is destined to be one righteous, unrighteous mess. Now, <clears throat> that's what's going to happen. Your kids will pay. That's what happened here. It's okay, preacher. What do I do in the case of the flesh? 
there are several things you need to do about your flesh. Number one, don't trust yourself. If you are here tonight and you trust yourself, you are already set up for a fall. I like what Dr. Ruckman says. He says this. He said, <clears throat> what you ought to do just before you go out of the house is he said, stop, look in the mirror, and say, what are you planning now, you rascal? <laughs> because, because you are the biggest crook you know. You may, I, well, you may not be the biggest crook you know, but you are the biggest crook you've got to deal with on a daily basis. Okay? I've often said this, and I, I don't say this to any problem at all. I'm a better man than Bill Clinton. I really am. You, you men are better men. I'm a better man than Bill Clinton. I never went out with my wife. Hey, I inhaled. <laughs> and I tried to get in to fight for this country, not go to Moscow and, and uh, pick it against and, and protest against this country and against this flag. I'm a better man. I'd say that if he's sitting on the front row here. Now, I, I wouldn't say it if Hillary was sitting on the front row. I don't know that I'm a better man than Hillary. <clears throat> when you talk that way around Hillary, they'll find you in a park somewhere with about four bullet holes in your head, eight guns laying on the ground, and about a dozen notes that say Hillary didn't know anything about this. <clears throat> but you know what? If I ever get knocked out of ministry, it won't be Bill Clinton. Be Sam Gipp. <coughs> I mean, we travel the world, and a report comes in about a preacher that fell. Wasn't Bill Clinton that caused it? You say, what was it? The devil? No, wasn't always the devil. It was their flesh. You know what you say? Well, I, you know, I know we're not supposed to do this, but I could do this, and it doesn't affect me. Don't trust yourself. Yeah, Number two, don't feed. Your flesh. Your flesh is like an old dog. You turn a dog loose, it'll find something to keep it alive. I don't know if you've ever thought about what a dog will eat. But a dog, your flesh will find enough to feed itself on a billboard on the way to work. Your flesh will find enough to feed itself during a commercial uh, during the football game. Your flesh will find enough to feed itself while you're going across the radio dial trying to find a station that you can listen to for the news or whatever. Don't, you don't need to feed your flesh. Uh, when I was in Bible college, there was a student <clears throat> that was uh, a year or two behind me. And um, Now, when I was in Bible college, and I don't go to movies, all right? I don't go to movies. The bad movie was Rosemary's Baby. I have never seen the movie. I know what it was about. <clears throat> I am not interested in it. Uh, I do understand that it's probably a Saturday morning cartoon compared to what's out there now. All right? But this guy said this. <clears throat> he said, I'm going to go see Rosemary's Baby. And I said, brother, I said, we don't go to movies. Why are you going to go see Rosemary's Baby? because I want to preach against it. He said, I can't very well preach against it if I don't see it. What do you think? I said, well, I hope you never want to preach against adultery. I hope you never want to preach against drug addiction. And if you ever want to preach against homosexuality, I don't want to be around for the research. <laughs> People... You beware of what you watch, what you read, what you look at, what you hear. You beware of the Internet. You beware of the films that you're going to see on your TV. Thank God for your VCR. You had better watch. Don't feed your flesh. Your flesh will feed itself. It will take care of itself. Thirdly, feed your soul. You know, feeding the soul is not something that happens naturally. Oh, I know there may be a rare occasion when you're driving down the road and you see this uh, Christian, uh, good Christian bumper sticker or something like that, or some billboard that says Jesus is Lord. That's good. But you know, I'm talking about feeding your soul. 
<clears throat> and the two best ways to feed your soul are be in church and get preached to. That is just good for you. You may not understand this. You know, I taught uh, this morning on the three Gospels. I didn't talk about uh, controlling your flesh or, or um, uh, stayed away from sin. You know that's good for your soul. It is just good to have that book come in in any form. So you need to put yourself where you can get priest to, and you need to read your Bible on a daily basis. You need to feed your soul. I told you, I read, <clears throat> I read a proverb for the date. I told you I read 10 pages a day. I read 30. 20 pages of the Old Testament, 10 pages of the New Testament. I do not do that to get new Bible lessons. I do not do that to get new sermons. I don't do that to get something that nobody else had. I do that to, su to uh, uh, suppress the wickedness of the most wicked personal individual that I have to deal with on a daily basis, me. Do you know that I haven't had a problem all day with Bill Clinton? In fact, I didn't have a problem yesterday with Bill Clinton. But Gip has been dogged in my tracks. Feed your soul. Next, <clears throat> learn to say no to yourself. We have a generation out here that is being raised. And, and, and look, Dr. Spock is in hell, and I am glad. Hey, when somebody damns a generation, you think I'm going to feel bad with that, when that guy gets what he's got coming. It would have been very nice that he trusted Christ. Uh, the only thing I feel bad is he's around here for 94 years. I uh, shouldn't have made it past about 14. There's about 80 more than he needed. America would be a better place if the guy had dropped over at 15 years old. You say, you're very cold. I'm telling you the cold, hard facts. That guy taught a, taught a, a generation of parents to raise kids never telling them no. You hear about these kids go down to, the, to their public school and shoot somebody, and they go, well, you know, somebody made fun of him. They said fatty. Well, you think that was a... You, they, they started that in the 90s, did you? <laughs> kids have been called that all their life. They just learned to control themselves. Yeah. Now we've got a generation that never has to say no to itself, never has to restrain itself, and, pal, if you think Clinton's generation is bad run this country, you better pray the Lord comes back before those guys hit the White House. You need to learn to say no to yourself. Now, I'm going to tell you how you can do it. I mean foolproof method. This will work. Now, this is not an overnight process. This will help you with your flesh if you will let it. I recommend fasting. I don't, I don't mean fasting and prayer for power. Uh, nah. I hear some guys, I've heard guys say, well, you need to fast for power with God. And I know they fast. I don't say power. I've, had, I've heard guys fasting and praying for God's direction in their life, and they fasted and prayed and still went and did the wrong thing. I'm not talking about fasting for something spiritual. Honest, I'm talking for something physical. Here's what will happen. I recommend this. <clears throat> I recommend that one day a week, one 24-hour period, one year, one day a week, say, set the date, Monday, or Wednesday, or Friday, or whatever you want, but one day a week, fast for that entire day and do that for one year. Now, do <clears throat> you know what will happen if you do that? I'll tell you what you'll do that day. You'll spend the entire day conversing with the biggest liar you have ever known. No, not you. Your body. You ever hear people say, I was talking to myself. Well, you probably weren't. You were probably talking to your body. We don't always agree. Here's what will happen. You get up that morning, your stomach will growl unusually loud, and you will not feed it breakfast, and you'll be somewhere at work about 10 o'clock in the morning, and your body will say, I'm going to get a headache. If you don't feed me, I'm going to get a headache. And you say, well, get the headache, bud, because I'm not... Oh, man. Then you'll find, you know, your kind of your knees are rubbery, your arms are shaking, your hands are shaking, uh, you're a little quick tempered, but you don't give in. Your body will say, "I'm going to pass out. I'm going to pass out. 
Uh, how are, well, you better think up a good story when I pass out and, and they bring me around and ask what happened, and you have to tell them you didn't feed me. <laughs> well, pass out, buddy. I'm not feeding you. Somewhere during the day, your body will come back and say, I'm going to die. <laughs> You're starving me to death. I'm going to now, can I tell you something? There is nobody in this room that is going to starve to death by not eating for one day. <clears throat> now, let me give you my medical legal disclaimer. <laughs> I'm dealing with Christians who know lawyers, so let me get this straight. <clears throat> There are some folks who have physical problems, let's say diabetes. There are diabetics who have to eat five and six and seven times a day. I mean, they have to eat throughout. Don't fast. It will be bad for your health. If you have a medical problem, that it will be bad for your health. Please, don't go, you know, I just see you. Uh, you're diabetic. You say, oh, I'm going to fast. And halfway through the day, Hoof. and you're standing in front of God, and he says, what are you doing here? It was Gip. <laughs> I just did what he told me. Well, I'll get him. <laughs> so, but the rest of you are healthy. Don't pray for diabetes. <laughs> don't pray for something that will make it so you've got to eat. You're a Baptist. You already believe in four meals a day. Isn't that enough? <laughs> now, no one is going to die. And your body will tell you. Your body will say, I'm going to die. And you're going to have to explain to the Lord while you're up there early. And you say, well, die, pal. I'm not feeding you. Do you know, I even know what the last argument your body will present to you, and I know when it will do it. This argument will come one half hour, approximately, before you're done. You say, I'm not going to eat for 24 hours. 23 and a half hours into this, you're 30 minutes away, man. I mean, you can see the finish line. You can smell the burgers cooking. <laughs> your body will say this. You win. You, you did it. I didn't think you could. I didn't believe you could, but you did it. No sense in waiting 30 minutes. I 